Uh, I think this this example is important in that the, the back to Tesla coil book that uh, that you've got. By the way, that book was written back in the late 80s, and uh, um, I think it's the only one that's left that's currently on the internet. Uh, there was another book that we wrote that had software. Uh, and uh, there may be a few places you can get them. There are three or four different places that sell them. And I think the book sells for 25 bucks, or 24 95 something like that. So tonight you can get it as a gift from the IAAA here for coming and enduring for, what, two hours uh, this, this talk on Tesla. Uh, all right, I've got to stop after this. I, I want to tell you where, I want to tell you where to go. Okay. Uh, where can you find more stuff? Uh, there is more bunk that has been written about Tesla. Uh, you know, and as an engineer, you want stuff you can use. And you don't want something that somebody is doing on the basis of intuition. Um, and some people's intuition is good, but uh, you know, all engineers work on the basis of, you know, my stuff is written that way. But you'd like to be able to find useful information. Uh, Bill Weissock for Experimenters uh, website is a really nice one to go to. It's just www.ttr.com. TTR is, is Tesla Technology Research. Bill is a ham radio operator. He's a graduate of not uh, OIT or DeVry, but a similar uh, uh, school out in the Los Angeles area. I think he graduated back in the 60s or so been licensed in radio operator since then. And uh, he does this on the side. He works at, at Aerospace Corporation where he does, you know, the uh, satellite dishes and stuff like that for military and communications. Um, Jim Harvest, he's up at Cornell. Uh, he's at www.artsandsparks.com. Uh, he's got lots of good stuff there. A lot more than just Tesla, all kinds of electrical engineering history. Now, uh, I haven't talked to you tonight about you know Tesla and the signals from Mars and the uh, the uh, 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 origins of radio astronomy. That paper, the reason why is because that paper, as well as the audio clip, is uh, on the internet at uh, uh, www.teslasociety.com. And that's the Tesla Memorial Society of New York. And we've got two papers there. You have to go down. I think our our paper on Mars is down about number 41. And the paper on Tesla's receiver. If you want to build your own Tesla receiver, and uh, like he has right in his diary, uh, we tell you how to do it. Um, and that's down somewhere. They got a picture of me there on the page, down underneath the picture somewhere. Uh, 21st Century Books has uh, they sell this book that you've got tonight. Um, these other ones will worry about. But let's see. I should mention this: this Tesla Memorial Society org. That's the Bill Turbo. Uh, he's Tesla's grand nephew. His brother, not his brother, his father, uh, I think his first name, Turbo, was Turbo short for Turbo, or something like that, is the guy that invented and patented the differential in the rear of an automobile. He did it back in World War I or so. So when the car went around the corner, it didn't drag one wheel. Right? You go back to the real old cars, they do. And he's the guy that invented and patented that was Tesla's nephew. Uh, another interesting thing about that I found out recently was that, uh, of course, he lived up in Detroit, and uh, I was stunned when I found out his neighbor was uh, Brace Beamer. Yeah, the Lone Ranger. Yeah, Brace Beamer. Brace, Brace Beamer is probably the most famous man. The most famous. I mean, who could be more famous than the Lone Ranger? Yeah, when we were kids, all right? Brace Beamer lived next door to uh, Tesla's grand nephew. Okay. Uh, there's another interesting book uh, called Wizard by Mark Seifer. Mark's a friend of mine. Um, you might want to try to get Mark out here sometime. He's not technical, but he sure has a wealth of information on, the, on Tesla. Um, don't pay attention to the other ones. All right. Uh, I haven't told you about Warden Clinton. And of course, I'm past my time now. Warden Clip was what, what happened in Long Island. After Tesla finished in Colorado Springs, where he's done fireballs and electrical discharges, you know, 100 feet long, and he's talking about wireless power transmission. And he goes back.
to, uh, to New York and starts on this endeavor which was never completed and it's torn down I think in uh, 19, uh, somewhere during World War I. Um, as recently in the uh, NASA, uh, the uh, Aerospace Museum in Washington, I had to go give a talk there. I went over to see the museum. If you haven't been there in the last couple of years, it's worth going back to see. And I was in the room where uh, they have the uh, Kitty Hawk stuff. And there written on the wall was something that was just, I thought was astonishing. It was written by uh, Orville Wright, December 17, 1903. He wrote, Isn't it astonishing? I realize it's 1903 when he's writing this. December, December 17th, I guess that's just about the time they did their flight. Okay. Isn't it astonishing? By the way, that was the 100th anniversary, it wasn't just uh, in back before Christmas. Isn't it astonishing that all these secrets have been preserved all these years just so that we could discover them? <laughs> hey, look! How long has the atmosphere been here? Ah, since the dawn of creation, it's always been there. Well, how long has it been used? hundred years. Nobody has ever replaced the North American power grid yet. You know, Mark Minister Fuller had this dream about, you know, he's the guy that invented that vaccine on all that. Had the dream of being able to connect all of the, the uh, uh, continents with an electrical power grid. You know? But if what Tesla has is true, then you don't need wires. Uh, there'll be another way to do this. Well, yeah, I was presenting a lecture on this stuff up at the National Research Council in Toronto once, and the guy from uh, uh, who was the head of the Quantum Electronics Division says, "Oh, this is nonsense. This, this is stupid." And he, he walks up to the board, you know, and he does the standard free transmission formula, you know, for you know, like you for pointing theorem, you know. It, this is the number of watts per square meter you get, falls off as one over R squared. It, 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 this can't be done. Imbecile. Uh, Tesla, in fact, in 1929 says, you cannot transmit power intelligently using Hertzian waves. You can't do it by um, inverse square radiation fields. What other kinds are there? Uh, if you listen to the crack crackpot French, they'll tell you about scalar waves and all that. Forget all of that. Keep your feet on the ground, you're electrical engineers. What other solutions are there besides what Hertz did? Well, Hertz didn't include the presence of the Earth. Right? Um, you know, he said, well, why couldn't I just put it down as a mirror and so forth? By the way, uh, the radiation from the antennas, you know, like you have for AM broadcasting with a, with, with a ground wave, uh, a vertical monopole with a um, uh, 120 ground radials, sorry, is what the FCC suggests, uh, each uh, at least a quarter of a wave long. Okay. Uh, where, where did that come from? Uh, it's attributed by Jonathan Zenick, again, who wrote the first radio engineering handbook, and I published by McGraw Hill in 1915, to Andre Blondel in France. And he says, look, if I have a monopole and I have a conducting ground plane, I can get the mirror image, and then what I've got the same field as if I had dipole in free space. Okay? And that's attributed to Blondell. He's the guy that comes up with the image plane antenna. Well, what was Blondell? Blondell was Tesla's assistant in Paris in 1892 when Tesla told him about this. So, uh, by the way, the solution of the monopole above the reflecting ground plane is not correct. It gives you the wrong answer for the Earth. Right? Why? Um, the guy that works out radio wave propagation over the surface of a, con a lossy conducting half space, and he does it in 1909, is uh, again Arnold Sommerfeld. And the amazing thing is that Sommerfeld agrees with Tesla. When you do the exact solution, those of you that know anything about radio wave propagation, when you do the exact solution for an antenna about a conducting half space, you get not only the direct ray and the image ray, but you also get as part of the solution and of the whole of the negative half plane uh, a surface wave that propagates along the edge of the surface. And that's normally called the Norton ground wave. That's where you get ground wave propagation for radios and for radio broadcasting. And it's really important at very low frequencies. Okay. 
So somehow or other, that's tied into this. When I talked with Jim Waite, just before he died, I talked to him, he died in October of 19, uh, 1998, he was the specialist on this. He says, nobody has worked this out yet. Here's the problem that needs to be solved. It's amazing that when you talk to somebody who really understands radio wave propagation, very sympathetic to what Tesla had to say. In fact, Wade always gave a great deal of credit to Tesla. All right, I've kept you way past the time. I have one last thing to say, and that's this. In Tesla, we have a very special and unique individual. Um, the IEEE published a, uh, a special issue of the proceedings back about 20 years ago on fundamental limits. You know, what's the smallest you can make a computer? And what's the fastest you can ever travel? What's the smallest you can make an antenna, you know, and still have it radiate? And of course the question comes up, what then are the fundamental limits for human beings, for us? Where are fundamental limits? I heard a wonderful comment made by uh, Earl Nightingale. Earl, Earl Nightingale. Who was Earl Nightingale? We should all know him. Bill, I know you all, but was because he was the guy that played uh, um, Sky King on radio. Or Sky King, you know, on the Flying A Ranch. And he always flew around in the, the dual airplane. And, uh, his daughter was Penny, and his nephew was Whipper. Yeah, yeah. Boy, we got a good crowd here tonight. This, this is amazing. I talk to places there, and I don't think I'm good. I'm not going to talk to the ceiling. I've got people that actually understand what I'm talking about. Earl Nightingale uh, played uh, Sky King, not on TV. No, that guy was, that was, that was, that was the real uh, uh, Sky King. The real Sky King was on the radio. Uh, and how many times did you see the guy uh, on TV you know, jump out of the airplane, go up on top of it, do something, and climb back in? You know, they never did something. For Earl Nightingale in his later years, this would have been the late 80s, and I think he's probably passed away, he had these little five minute talks on the radio that they would put in, you know, sort of uh, motivational events. And he got talking one day, and I just happened to catch him, about what are the fundamental limits on a human being. And he says, look, this is what we're limited by. Uh, we're limited by the inventory of what we can do. That's why it's so important that you come and you study all the stuff you can. Go in the lab and, and get all the experience you can, all right? We're limited by the inventory of what we can do. Individuals are limited by the tether of their imagination. If you can't imagine it, you're never going to do it. And even that isn't enough. How many people have we seen that have ended up on the rocks and the shoals that have talent and ability you know, they, they, they can do all kinds of things. They have tremendous imaginations. There's one last thing that limits people, at least that he, he pointed out, that is the strength of his desire. If it isn't in you to do it, you never do it. You dream about it, that's good, but it's not enough. All right? Three things. Earl Nightingale, give him credit if you're writing that down. Earl Nightingale, all right? By the way, you can find this on the internet. I'm sure he's got it there someplace. The inventory of what he can do, the tether of his imagination, and the strength of his desire. All right. We have a desire tonight. Here's a puzzle. It needs to be solved. Look, do you think that the 21st century is going to be anything like the 20th century? I remember reading in Scientific American in the 1880s, they said, oh, the world's come to an end. We're all going to be in the dark in the, in the, in the 20th century. There just aren't, there isn't enough whale bulb or whip where this can't make lights anymore. They, they didn't have a clue as to what was coming, see. And, you know, when it always gets me when these futurists all get together on TV, and, and what do they talk about? What do they talk about? Well, better ways to make fountain pens. Oh, we have a better pen right underwater or do something like that. You know, where is there... When you dream ahead as to what tomorrow's going to be, right? what can you see? And you can dream wild dreams, but it's, it's in your hands. What are you going to make it? If it's got to be, if we're going to have wireless power transmission, run automobiles without without gasoline, tell the Arabs to eat sand. Um, <laughs> if these things are going to happen, and, and surely they'll happen. I mean, look, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, this would have been this would have been thought of as impossible. And yet I can talk into this thing, you know, and be heard in Moscow? Yeah. Um, 
I do it all the time, you know. My ham radio big now. Mike's a little bit bigger, but I mean, it's the same thing. Don't you think that someday there's going to be some way that we're going to do these kinds of things? Why, sure. And I haven't even begun to tell you about what, what you can do when you dig into the papers that Einstein wrote in 1927 about torsion and modifying the space-time manifold. And, wow, what, you know, we can get to Mars without having to go through all the space between here and there, but yeah, that's another topic. Okay, well, that's enough. You've been a nice audience. Thanks for everything. Thank you everybody for coming. We should have brought sleeping blankets in there. So that one go all night. That was amazing. I really like it. Dr. Norman, my name before you go. Your yeah. presentation was excellent. I have one quick question. You teased this at the beginning by mentioning Tesla and 61st versus, say, 50. Yeah. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, how did you do know that? Uh, he did that at Westinghouse in the early 1890s. There's a, uh, there's a book called It's the Autobiography of Benjamin Garfield Blanket Planet. You can find it in the EU library, and all they have two or three copies of it uh, at OSU. And Lindy uh, uh, was the chief engineer at Western Company. Uh, he worked with Tesla very closely. Tesla was mentioned with the places in there. But what Tesla did was this. He looked at, you know, when you look at the new iron, it's got a real part. Imaginary part. Imaginary part for the losses. What I did was he said, hey, these are numbers, these are functions, So let me look at the, the losses. I'll plot the losses for the frequencies for the people, the iron and the transform. And then I'll also plot the losses for the, the, the uh, copper losses. And they put the hysteresis losses. And you draw these curves, and you always, and all you hold is a sweet point. You do the same thing when you put uh, like, uh, one curve looks like this, one curve looks like this, and not. this is the one. That's the frequency I want to hear. Well, this is in the range between oh, uh, 40 hertz to 70 hertz. I choose 60 hertz. Uh, 60 hertz is nice because I can run it twice. Speak to those things. Over here, I'll leave the visuals with me. Anybody else have a question? I'll be delighted to answer anything I can. Can't, can't answer it. We don't know all the answers either. We're still in the, this is that kind of piece of ongoing. Wish I could tell you about some of the experiments that we're conducting right now. But, um, the stuff that we can't tell you about in the book. It's been wonderful. Thank you.